our final fuel problem, we, we'd be out in the field for about 10 or 11 days. We'd do a 16 mile tactical foot march and then we'd we break into this large assembly area and they would attack one of the, the mount size of Fort Benning. And what they did not know is we had op four and blower suits in the buildings. So they're smoked after 10, 11 days in the field, they've walked all night and now they're gonna you know, enter buildings and clear rooms and there's a guy in a blower suit that's gonna tackle them. And I saw firsthand <laughs> the, the character of some of our junior leaders that big, with wide eyes that said, we had no idea. And you're right, when you can close with the enemy, you can overcome a lot of things. Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters podcast, focusing on what's important to the total Army community. We bring vital Army conversations and interviews on issues relevant to soldiers, military families, and all of you amazing Army supporters. Rotating each week, our show includes Soldier Today, Leading Great Teams, Family Voices, and Thought Leaders. Let's tune into the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Colonel Retired Scott Halstead from the Center of Leadership at the Association of the United States Army. And welcome to this episode of Army Matters. Today, I'm honored to be joined by two incredible leaders, Colonel Brian Ducote and Command Sergeant Major Mark Ekstrom. They are the command team for the 1st Brigade 10th Mountain Division based out of Fort Drum, New York. And by the time you listen to this podcast, these two leaders and their brigade will be deployed to Iraq and Syria. During this podcast, we're going to talk about how they prepared their soldiers for their mission, their own leadership lessons over the course of their careers, and then how to strive to create rivers instead of lakes. On a personal note, I first met then Major Brian Ducote in Afghanistan in the fall of 2011. And not only was I was impressed with him as a leader, I've had the great opportunity to stay in touch with him over the years as he continues to move up in the Army and continue to build and lead great teams. I have not served with Command Sergeant Mark Ekstrom, but I did serve with his son, Justice, who was a senior leader on the Cadet Honor Committee at West Point. And Justice is one of the finest young men I've ever known. So I can only imagine that's a direct result of his father's influence. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Let's start with you, Colonel Ducote. Can you describe some of the most important leader development experiences that you've had so far in your career? Yes, sir. First, I'll tell you that we are so deeply appreciative and thankful and really humbled for you to give us this opportunity to speak about some of the leaders, the great work and leadership within the Warrior BCT. We are incredibly proud to serve with and for them. For me, the most impactful leader development events were the various deployments. The experiences I had there had a fundamental impact on how I view training, for example, specifically how we have to always continually push the envelope on the conditions in which we're training. We have to challenge our foundation, not be content with where we are, and always seek the next level by increasingly challenging the environment. Personally, my time deployed taught me about loss and sacrifice. I learned to make it matter. I need only to reflect on the tremendous burden that our Gold Star families in particular bear to put things back in perspective. Uh, when I think of patriots who made the ultimate sacrifice, many of whom I've known throughout my you know, years growing up, and no longer with us, my heart and mind immediately recenter on what's actually important. So I never want to take my family for granted. I never want to take the soldiers and their families for granted. So I think it's important that those experiences have made me the leader that I am. So th those are probably the biggest. I distinctly remember in the brigade headquarters at Fah Saab, that wall with, with all the heroes from 2nd Brigade of the 101st Task Force Strike, 3rd Brigade of the 10th Mountain Task Force Spartan, I was in awe. Again, all the times I've deployed, I have never seen a unit that was more disciplined, more focused, one on taking care of each other, but also on taking the fight to the enemy than your brigade and 10th Mountain Division. So that was your legacy. That's what you passed off to us. Sorry, Major, how about you? What, what are some of the most important leader development experiences you've had in your 28-year career? Sir, first of all, I'd like to you know, start by saying you know, thank you for uh, allowing us to, to do this podcast today and, and share some of our things. Uh, like you, until this uh, position, I had never served in the 10th Mountain Division. However, I had served alongside the 10th Mountain Division, you know, multiple times and always, you know, was impressed by the professionalism of the organization. So when I found out that I was coming to 1st Brigade 10th Mountain, the first person I told outside of my commander at the time was a CSM that is uh, that was in this brigade at that time. 
and, uh, you know, tell them, hey, man, I'm so excited to be a part of this team. So as far as impactful events, it is all those transitions where you go from one echelon to another, from uh, just being a, a battle buddy to uh, moving up to be a, a team leader. I've always said that the smartest person in the Army is a non-promotable specialist because he knows it all. And then once you put some weight on his shoulders as far as, hey, here's some responsibility, you make him a corporal or a sergeant, and then he realizes, hey, now, now I understand as far as what it takes in order to uh, move a echelon or, or organization like a team leader, all the way up from uh, from battalion to uh, to transitioning to a brigade CSM. There's so many things that you take for granted until you have that weight on your shoulders as far as now this is what the organization needs from me. People say, okay, what what do you want to accomplish at this level that you're working in? I just I want to be the person within the organization is able to carry the heavy water for their organization to where they are able to accomplish their duties at their echelon. You know, as I transition and it, it, it's uh, ever changing and you learn some stuff about yourself and the organization. Sergeant Major, I appreciate that perspective. As you've talked about these transitions, I'm thinking about all of the commissioned officers you've trained and inspired from your earliest platoon leaders all the way now to Colonel Dakota. And for me, really, that's the strength of the non-commissioned officer corps. They train and inspire everyone around them, regardless of rank. And that's the strength of our Army. Speaking of strength, Colonel Ducote, who are some of the people that have had a significant impact on you and why? So when I was reflecting about this question, I was reminded of a really powerful concept called initial conditions. And it's this idea that in the beginning of an organism's life cycle, different conditions can have a fundamental impact, good and bad, over its entirety of its lifespan because of what it experienced, what it was exposed to in the beginning. So for me as a young lieutenant and a young key and developmental complete captain, my initial conditions were several platoon sergeants and a first sergeant who made a fundamental impact on who I am as a person and for who I am now and who I will be as a professional. So if I had to name some folks, I'd say Sergeant First Class Eddie Kimbrough, Staff Sergeant Jerry McNeil, uh, Sergeant First Class Felipe Ogas, Sergeant First Class Rodney Harrington, and later First Sergeant Jerry Cornell. Just an unbelievable cohort. Those five core individuals had a profound impact on me, inspired within me a deep sense of confidence and appreciation for really the NCO Corps, which I believe separates the U.S. Army from any other fighting force in the world. That influence was so profound on me that years later in 2004, 2005, as I'm still getting ready to take command and a lot of folks are getting out, let's be honest, at that point in time, there was a lot of fighting. We were in Iraq for the first, my second deployment. And all it took was, you know, when everyone was getting out, all my peers were exiting the army. All it took was for Sergeant Major Darren Bond, who later became Command Sergeant Major, the Senior Listen Advisor for the Af- for AFRICOM, to say, Hey, sir, I need you to stay in. Just put his hand on my shoulder, said, you care about soldiers, you care about families, you got a good head on your shoulders, stay in. Sir, that was it. I was in. I was in for life because he believed in me. And But if it wasn't for that foundational impression that was made by my platoon sergeants years earlier, it probably wouldn't have had the impact that it did at that moment. Darren Bond was my brigade command sergeant major when I was a battalion commander, so I definitely understand the outsized impact that one leader can have on every other leader in that formation. And when I talk about leaders, I mean every sergeant, every officer, certainly me as a battalion commander, all of us benefited from his leadership and patience. You know, he would just walk into my office. He could sense that I was struggling with something. And then he could provide context and and reassure me in a way that really only senior non-commissioned officers can do. And often the solution was right in front of us. He would just help us connect the dots and see that for ourselves. We're going to take a brief break, but after we get back, we'll talk more about the cultures created by these two leaders. Join AUSA, the Army's premier professional association and host of the largest land power exposition in the United States. AUSA is open to everyone, including all ranks and components. So whether you have a relationship with the U.S. Army or simply want to honor those who serve, you can learn more at AUSA.org slash join. Welcome back to Army Matters. I'm here with Colonel Dakota and Command Sergeant Major Ekstrom of the 1st Brigade Combat Team, 10th Mountain Division, 
as they prepare their unit to deploy to Iraq and Syria. Gentlemen, we'll get into what you're doing with your brigade here in a second. But first, let's talk about some key leadership initiatives that you've been a part of over the course of your careers. So for me, I've always found it important to personalize standard Army processes to fit a particular organization or a leader's personality. And I do that through leader professional development. I believe you have to be the leader of the organization that the team needs as opposed to what you may think it wants. And so, for example, one of the techniques that we did early on is outlined how we fight across the war fighting functions. And we described this in a forum with leaders and we got together, we whiteboarded it, but then we adjusted it according to the dialogue. And that collective buy-in and perspective is what really solidified as an organization how we would fight. And we did that in the beginning of the training cycle. We'll do it later as we get new leaders in in order to make sure that continues on. So that's that's one technique. Another technique is codifying standard operating procedures. I know people say that all the time about, about SOPs, 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 but it's important to make the SOPs match the leader that you have in the organization. For example, we personalize the steps of the military decision-making process to resonate with our particular organization. We do course of action analysis a certain way. We do war gaming a specific way. We do our combined arms rehearsal that is indicative of the type of leaders we have in our organization. It fits our personalities. And another technique I would say is I like using combatives to coach junior leaders. We roll with company commanders and first sergeants and field grade officers all the time. It's a great way to teach humility. It's a great way to teach overcoming your fears by getting in the ring, win or lose in front of your senior raider and your peers. It also teaches grit and toughness. And it also teaches this idea that repetition under increasingly difficult adverse conditions makes things second nature. Right. Like all forms of training, it's one thing to be able to do something by the numbers, so to speak, but it's another thing to execute it when you're tired, bleeding, cold, wet, and potentially losing. So, just like combatants, if a move is off just a smudge, it won't work. So I, I'm smiling here. I did not grow up with combatants. That wasn't the army I grew up with, but you know, it became a big part of the army around 2008, 2009. I don't remember who in my unit had this idea, but our final field problem, we, we'd be out in the field for about 10 or 11 days. We'd do a 16 mile tactical foot march, and then we'd we break into this large assembly area and they would attack one of the, the mount sites at Fort Benning. And what they did not know is we had Op 4 and Blower suits in the buildings. So they're smoked after 10, 11 days in the field. They've walked all night and now they're going to you know, enter buildings and clear rooms. And there's a guy in a Blower suit's going to tackle them. And I saw firsthand <laughs> the, the character of some of our junior leaders that big, with wide eyes that said we had no idea. And you're right. When you can close with the enemy you can overcome a lot of things. John, we spoke earlier, your brigade has been sprinting. I mean, we talked about you start off with, you know, expert instruments badge, training and testing, squad live fires, platoon live fires, you know, combined arms live fires. You went to the Joint Race Training Center in January, did very well there, came back, started outloading equipment for your upcoming deployment. You did a pre-deployment site survey. And then you just mentioned that you're still you have the confidence in your team that you can rotate out some company battery troop level commanders and first sergeants. And so how do you do that? You know, when you're on the on the road to a deployment, what is it in your organization that you have faith in your leaders? How do you develop these leaders so you identify and can can mitigate the risk to the mission of changing out important leaders this close to a deployment? Well, I think the first thing is to create a strong culture and to use the analogy, a river versus a lake, you want a culture that's like a river where new individuals that come in to an organization, they're swept away by the current. And this analogy is the, is the culture where they just fall into how we do business and how we think and they accept and embrace and they can almost, they can sense it when they come into the organization. And that's really important. What you don't want is a lake where they just kind of jump in and feel free to go any direction they want. You want that strong culture, that strong current to carry them in, in the right direction where they then can be part of the culture and the current to do so for others in the future. The other thing is we really strive to encourage a level of vulnerability in the organization to foster open and empowered organizations that, that are fueled by trust. And so 
we're pretty decentralized. And we reinforce this through everything we do, especially in counseling, especially in training, but also in our leader professional development, where the experts can own it and they can say, we we will passionately instruct you on what is you know, our area of expertise and not through slides, but through dialogue. And Peter Senge's book, uh, The Fifth Discipline, it really gets into the difference between discussion and dialogue. And I talk to our junior leaders about this all the time. Discussion is, I have a perspective, you have a perspective, may come to some sort of agreement. We largely depart our separate ways with our notions pretty much the same, preconceived notions. Right. Dialogue, there's a level of suspension of your preconceived notions, your biases, your thoughts on a particular topic where you realize the in the aggregate, the dialogue is going to generate something unique, the sum of the all parts. And so it is really important to leverage the full intellectual and creative capacity of the organization. Everyone has a voice. Everyone gets a vote. But yet at the same time, you got to preserve the integrity of the chain of command. It's still a military organization, but creating that environment, I, I assess, would, is really what allows us to have people own their sphere of influence, own their area of expertise, and then really share it passionately because we've let the reins off of them to do what they love to do and empower them and trust them to do it. Summer, how about you? I mean, you've you've changed out company first sergeants. I mean, how what is it about your organization that can absorb that transition this close to deployment? Like the commander talked about the climate and culture. So everybody needs to be able to understand, you know, what's what's happening one level up and then how can I affect those levels down in order to accomplish the mission? We uh, had three change of commands. Last week, we had four oh. changes of responsibility. It just constantly, but the capabilities within the uh, brigade will continue to uh, to be great. Um, I think uh, all those uh, levels of leadership, they understand that that we trust them. Okay, and the commander talked about trust. We're, we're trusting we're going to help them solve problems. They're going to be on that river that the commander talked about. There's going to be a, a rapid that they're going to have to get through, but we're going to be there to help them get through that rapid, get that uh, raft that they need in order to uh, breach through that with, uh, without any challenges. I'd be willing to bet that if I served in your formation and I worked really hard, but of course made honest mistakes, that you two would be willing to underwrite those honest mistakes and you'd continue to coach me. Your subordinates or teammates, they probably don't know this yet, but you're really developing them for what they're going to do, not only right now leading at the company battery troop and battalion level, but you're really preparing them and investing them for the long-term health of the Army. And as you know, some of those benefits won't be seen until they're more senior leaders, and they'll be able to look back and realize that, wow, my brigade commander and my brigade command sergeant major, they trusted me, and they gave me the leeway and the assets to accomplish the mission. And as they get older, I think your investment in them will really begin to pay dividends long after you've taken off the uniform and your current teammates, they'll look back and go, you know what? I really learned a lot when I served in the 1st Brigade, 10th Mountain Division. I like to wrap up all these podcasts by asking our guests about their philosophy on leadership and lifelong learning. So what books would you recommend that help shape your thoughts on leadership? Well, sir, first of all, you had said uh, if you had served in our organization, you'd probably be able to take something on. I do believe we have an AS3 position coming open. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am. Uh, so, yeah, I, you can work me hard. I, I, okay. I am uh, strong like bull. So, yeah, I'll give right. to work. All right. Sounds good. Unless and, he, you, and he has the humility to do that. That's right, the thing. Right. You have so much <laughs> humility. So I know you. You'd be like, you fit right in. You take your desk. But what do you need? What does the team need me to do? That's right. I just need a, I just need a hot cup of coffee in the morning. Then I'll run through a wall for the team. Sounds good. Sounds good. So, sir, uh, actually, the book I just read um, is A Tribe by Sebastian Junger. And the reason the reason I read that is uh, what does it take in order to be strong within a tribe? It goes through uh, Native Americans and things that they did within their tribes that kept them bonded together. And it goes through, uh, talks about different wars that different countries have gone through and how they the country was stronger during times of challenges than outside of challenges. And then also uh, talked about, you know, uh, PTSD and veterans and how they get through that and what helps them as far as uh, having a, a close uh, relationships and how do they use that in order to uh, get through whatever challenges they have. Actually, yesterday uh, we had a, a conversation with a lot of our uh, soldiers that are getting ready to uh, ETS from the Army. We speak with a, a young sergeant. He's got a, a solid plan in order to get out of the Army. A whole lot of potential for this young sergeant. I would love to, like I said, twist his arm and keep him in. 
but I, but uh, you know, he, he said he's uh, got some things moving. His family's already uh, situated. Uh, so I talked about, hey, there's going to be some challenges you have out there. So what are you going to do in order to uh, take care of yourself? And so I talked about, about that book and told him some things that could benefit him as far as uh, being able to reach out to organizations or, or just keep you know, relationships that he built in the Army in order to help him with his personal and professional goals. I haven't read Tribes yet, but I've heard some really good things about it. And Colonel Ducote, are there any books you'd like to recommend? I'd recommend five books. The first one is Leadership and Self-Deception by the Arbinger Institute. It is one of the best books about attitude and perspective and how you carry yourself in an organization. How do you contribute to the climate of an organization daily? The next book I'd say is Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. That book talks all about vulnerability and openness and having the humility to lead with the understanding that you are not perfect and nor is anyone. And it's about the organization, not about you. From a readiness perspective, I'd recommend This Kind of War. My friend Mike. <laughs> that is one of the best books. If you read it now, especially in these times, it has particular meaning. And in a similar vein, The Guns of August is historically is one of the, I think one of the finer pieces I've read. I just finished a book called Legacy by James Kerr, and I recommend that one. A good friend of mine, Rob Shaw, recommended that to me, and I read it. And that one is about humility and sweeping the sheds, so to speak. Those are the top five that I would absolutely recommend. One of my bosses gave me the guns of August when I got promoted to major, and I thought, why is he giving me a book about World War I? And I, I started it. I got bored with it. And it was seven or eight years later, I went back to it. And it is amazing. I just lack the professional maturity at that point to, to understand. But you're right. That's amazing. This kind of war legacy. I mean, classics. OK, Jim, I'll turn over to you for any closing comments. Anything you want to share with our listeners? No, I just like to publicly state just how, how proud I am of the leaders, soldiers, non-commissioned officers, officers and really families within 1st Brigade Combat Team, 5th Mountain Division. What we've been through, what we've done the last several months has been nothing short of extraordinary. It really is humbling to think think about it. Words often fall short when you say thank you. Thank you is not enough almost. You just have a deep sense of admiration and respect for the sacrifices our soldiers and families make. It's really, really exceptional in what they've done. So we have, got, we have some really great leaders. We are humbled to, again, serve with and for them. And really, again, thank you for giving us this platform to highlight some of the the things that we do in this brigade that have, have worked and some things that have not worked. Before we finish, I want to highlight that that you two use the words we, us, and our quite a bit. And I did not hear you say I or me. And for me, that's an indicator of selflessness and humility. And so I, I love the back and forth dialogue that you all encourage from your teammates and subordinates where you're really, you're not only transmitting, but you're receiving and you rely upon that bottom-up feedback to make difficult decisions. By the time this episode is released, your brigade will be deployed to Iraq and Syria. So I really appreciate the time you've spent with us to talk about how you develop leaders, how you've gotten your brigade ready for, for operations in Iraq and Syria. And so from me, the AUSA Center Leadership, and the entire AUSA team, we wish you the best of success and Godspeed during your current mission. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army Day. Hua. <laughs>